this is Helen Patton, Security in Higher Ed, What It's Like to Secure a City. Take yeah. it away. Thank you. So when I was writing the abstract for this, it really, I changed the name. So if you're wondering why it doesn't say running a city in higher ed, uh, I change it because it should be, what would the CISO do? So uh, what I wanna do in this session is have you pretend to be me, which was the CISO at Ohio State. Um, right now, I'm an advisory CISO at Cisco and Duo, but uh, I've only been doing that for about two months. Eight years before that, I was the CISO at Ohio State. Um, and eight years is a long time to be CISO. Uh, I think I have a bit of a masochistic streak in me. I'm, I'm not sure. You will find me at, at CISO Helen on Twitter. You'll find me on LinkedIn as well. So if you want to follow along, follow me there. Feel free to do that. Um, so yeah, so the point of this talk is to talk about um, what it's like to try and do security in an organization that is like a city. Um, some of you may or may not know Ohio State. So I'm gonna give you uh, some background. I became the CISO at Ohio State in 2013. And prior to being the CISO at Ohio State, I was doing security at JP Morgan. So here I am, I come from, a Wall Street bank. And when you're doing security in a Wall Street bank, everybody tells you, you that like you're the best at security because you're a financial sector and you're highly regulated. And so you must know everything to do with security. So there was that. I had a bit of a complex. And two, I thought teaching, being a CISO in higher ed is about teaching and learning. It's about kids in classrooms. How hard can this be? Like really? Yeah. So welcome to Ohio State. As I do this, think about your company or think about the company you're thinking about going to and sort of compare what your company looks like to this one and, um, and we'll compare notes. All right, so here's some information about Ohio State. The numbers that you see here, I think are a couple of years old now. These aren't the numbers that I had in 2013, but they haven't changed too terribly much. So in any given year, we've got about 70,000 students. Most of them are undergrad. Most of them are on campus in Ohio, although some of them are overseas. Uh, we've got about 45,000 employees. And from an employee perspective, that includes uh, teaching staff, researchers, administrative staff. It also includes the folks who work at the hospital, because you'll notice that we've got seven hospitals under our umbrella as well. We have about 600,000, I'm rounding for, for because I'm rounding, makes it sound better. We've got about 600,000 living alumni, and we got more dead ones than that. And dead ones still come up in your security profile every once in a while. So we'll talk about that. We have on any given year, we have about 57,000 patients, if not more. The budget, almost $8 billion of budget a year. Um, of that, about a quarter of it maybe is the hospital. The rest is the university side of things about a million of that is research dollars. Uh, sorry, a billion of that is research dollars, almost. There's an endowment. Uh, so as universities do, we, we have a lot of our, our operational income, but also other kinds of things that come through our endowment. We have about 1300 buildings and those buildings could be anything from a, room, um, a, a building that has a lot of classrooms in it to a hospital to a uh, sports facility, to an entertainment center, all that kind of stuff. About 16,000 acres across six campuses. Um, some hospitals, uh, we have four international locations, two primary data centers in the US, not including what we put into cloud, uh, public private cloud. We've got an airport, we've got some golf courses, we've got hotels, and among other things, we've got a nuclear reactor. All of this stuff, by the way, we're a public institution, it's publicly available. Okay, so I rock up and I'm thinking, yeah, this is kids in classrooms. And then I'm like, what, what, what? <laughs> like, what do you do with this now? What's your risk profile? Uh, I can't just show up and talk to business leadership and say, what are your crown jewels? You know, we've heard this, right? You go to a lot of conferences and they say, start with your crown jewels. Well, crown jewels? Is it my students? Is it my patients? Is it the healthcare system that we're running and the medical records? Or is it um, the 
student financial aid that goes, which is many millions of dollars worth of financial aid, is it the endowment? There's a lot of money there, right? So is that my crown jewel? Mm -mm. Or do I have, I, I just became a jeweler. I've got like hundreds of thousands of crown jewels from a data perspective, from a business process perspective, from a physical security perspective, you know, 1300 buildings with five different security swipe systems that are going on. Ah, like, yeah. So, um, so deep breaths, Helen, after I called myself self up into the fetal position, I had to go, okay, what do I do with this? How do I do planning around this? What does this mean? So what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk is sort of talk you through what are some of the elements that I think about as a CISO, as a security leader, when you've got all this shit going on and how might I put that into a security plan that makes sense for an organization like this. Now your organization might be super small and super focused on one particular industry or one kind of data or one kind of technology, or maybe it's you, you've got something like this, which is sort of really a, a multi-headed beast. Um, but, but these strategic planning steps are going to be similar for everybody. It's just sort of a matter of scope and scale. Okay. So let's start first. The first thing you've got to work out is what does your organization care about and how do they think about security? Um, you'll notice that there are five little circles on this particular graph. Uh, it actually sort of aligns to a lot of maturity models if you've seen them. So one is we don't know what we're doing, we're not really doing anything. Two, five is wow, we are so organized, we optimized our security every single day. I don't know anyone anywhere who's a five. I know very few people who are four. Most of us tend to sit in the one to three and we really hope that we're effective. Um, but the more you, the further you go along this arrow, the more complex it gets from a tech perspective, from a security philosophy perspective, and the more it costs, right? So you've got to think about your vertical. If I was in um, back in JP Morgan Chase, their security budget was more than the entire IT budget of Ohio State, right? So they've got some money to burn comparatively. Um, but the university is not going to put up with duct tape and chewing gum because our regulators won't like it. Um, our, certainly our, our researchers and our students won't like it. Our um, alumni who give to that billion dollar endowment, they're not going to like it. So not duct tape and chewing gum, but probably somewhere between good enough and effective is an appropriate place for higher ed. And by the way, for all of you who are like, ah, oh, higher ed is so expensive. One of the reasons is we got lots of regulations that we have to think about in addition to just trying to do the right thing from a security perspective. But I know as a security person, every dollar I ask for for a security thing is considered to be a dollar that's not spent on scholarships or endow or 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 free stuff, you know, or or sort of that equity and inclusion piece of what's so important to higher ed. So you got to start with your values and think about where does your organization fit on this? So give that a thought. Where does your organization fit on this scale? Are you duct tape and chewing gum? You want to be like award winning somewhere in the middle. Okay. So there's some elements that go into strategies. Um, I like mind maps. This is a very simple mind map. Um, if you're going to take anything away from this particular talk, this might be the slide to take a picture of or a screen capture of. Um, I'm going to go and talk about each one of these six things. But in general, as you think about putting together a strategy, these are the elements that you need to take into account. And so as we go through these, we're going to talk about this and I'll talk about this from a higher ed perspective. But um, you're going to have your own particular views of each of these. So let's start with compliance. Okay, so I walk into Ohio State, and by the way, Ohio State's like the third largest university in the United States, but it's not unique. Arizona State, Florida, Kentucky, um, Tennessee, like we, we're all sort of, any sort of research university is going to be in the same kind of boat that Ohio State is. Um, location, when you're putting a strategy together, location's important. I had to worry about a lot of regulations, but I didn't have to worry too much about 
Australia or England or um, Singapore or any international sort of spaces unless we had offices there. So we did have offices in China and Brazil and India and Romania, but we didn't. So, you know, location is going to determine what you have, to, what, which laws you have to pay attention to. Industry is definitely a thing. If you're in the energy sector, you're going to have to deal with NERC SIP, whatever, um, whatever data types you have. So if you're collecting private information about your employees, at least, if not about your customers, you're going to have privacy regs you've got to think about. And of course, your technology architecture is also going to determine what kind of compliance and framework standards you want to comply with. Um, if you're cloud native, you might be looking at a cloud security um, alliance kind of framework and that might work really well for you. So what's Ohio State got going on? Well, we're subject to GLBA because we've got student financial aid and they think like we're a bank. We're subject to PCI because, you know, just one football game, we have 100,000 people in the stands for a Saturday afternoon and they're all buying beer and, you know, Buckeye stuff. And yeah, PCI is the thing. We've got cafeterias on campus. We've got bookstores on campus. We sell stuff. And yeah, PCI is a thing. Um, we are subject to FERPA, which is the uh, M Education Act. So all of our student data is covered by FERPA. We've got our hospitals. So that's HIPAA. Uh, we do have a power plant. Uh, let's the, the nuclear act is just for research. It's not really active, but um, you know, we've got, we've got a steam factory going on for heating and cooling. So we've got energy issues that are going on. We have to think about that. Um, we have our own airport that's got its own weird things. So what should I use, right? What's the framework I should follow? Do I make everybody comply to the higher standards? Actually, we're subject to CMMC and Department of Defense Security for some of the research we do for the DOD. Am I gonna make everybody hit that level? No. So thinking about, I need a framework. I need people to be talking the same language. Um, I need them to be compliant with laws and regulations. How do I do that? Um, short answer, by the way, segmentation is my friend, um, but I'll come back to that in a second. So we think about compliance. It's the first thing when you're putting a strategy together, you should start with. Not because I think compliance means security, but it sure doesn't mean security if you don't have it. And you can really get into trouble really fast if you don't have it. So start with compliance. Business needs. Okay, so what's going on in higher ed? Uh, we People think it's too expensive, um, but they really like climbing walls. Um, they wanna be able to do their work from anywhere. We have people in Antarctica, we have people in the Arctic, like we're, we're in, all continents, all islands, all locations, and they wanna be able to get their stuff back to our systems. So they wanna be everywhere. Um, distance education is becoming a thing. So, you know, more and more of our students don't actually wanna to come to campus actually anymore. And more of our students are adult learners than traditional students, which you may not realize. So those folks wanna have much more technology support than maybe they did before. And over the last eight years at Ohio State, we've also gone from an on-premise ERP system to a cloud-based ERP system. And that was for HR, that was for finance, and it will be for student as well. You can go Google all of this, none of it's private. What are those business needs and what does that mean for security, right? So remote users, this is pre-COVID, remote users working from anywhere, cloud-based but hybrid um, with lots of regulation around it. It's a thing. And Oh, by the way, the business believes that information and data default should be shared. So I've got to do security in a cultural environment where they say, why would I put controls around data? Yeah, yeah, that's fun. Okay, third thing, what's your org structure? Now this may not tell you what you need to do for, in your security strategy and what projects, but it's sure gonna inform your how right? In my role, I had two bosses. I reported to the CIO, but I also reported to the chief compliance officer. The reason for that was in 2010, they had a really big breach. They lost 750,000 student records. They did not have a security program at that time. And it originated out of the CIO shop. So when they created the security team and created the security 
CISO role, to their credit, they said, we think it's an IT role, which, okay, I'm going to argue with them on that one, probably. But there needs to be an independent reporting line that the CISO can call on if they need to. So the compliance officer goes up through legal and up through the, to the board, and the CIO goes up through to the president of the United States, two bosses, right? But it also means I've got two major stakeholders that have different needs that I've got to take care of. And thirdly, thirdly, because, you know, two fingers and then there's three, uh, the budget owner was neither of those. It really became, it came down to both the financial office and a group called the Senate Fiscal Finance Committee that may ultimately made decisions about budget priorities. So whatever I did had to be reasonable and understandable to those folks as well. And then I didn't have to worry about this so much, but in your company, you may also have this question of, do you insource things and outsource things? Do you pay for pen testers to come and, and do security assessments of your environment? Is that cool to do that? What does your organization think about outsourcing? Do you outsource your SOC? You know, all of those kinds of questions. And so this sort of tolerance of, we do our own thing, thank you very much, or we have to do our own thing because we're a unique snowflake and no one can really do it for us, which happens in higher ed a lot are things to take into account. All right, four, good practice. So one of the things that I think keeps CISOs up at night everywhere is that if you were to be on the receiving end of a breach, and we recognise that at some point you probably will, some armchair quarterback is going to second guess you and they're going to go, why the hell didn't that CISO have XYZ in place? Why didn't they have a better vulnerability management program? Why weren't they doing purple teaming? Why blah, 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 right? Everyone's, a, especially on Twitter, we're really good at second guessing what happens, right? But I think that it's reasonable to say that there are certain things that security needs everywhere in order to do a decent job of getting to effective, right? Asset management, basic cyber hygiene, patching, keeping up to date and current, that kind of thing, to doing a basic tech refresh, having some level of incident detection and response, a sort of jacks for openness for any kind of security program. So as I was thinking about this strategy of, okay, I've got all of these rules that I have to follow and laws that I have to follow and which framework should I deal with and what are the business objectives coming up and all of those things on top of that, I needed to evaluate how well we were doing the basics. And if we weren't doing the basics very well, should I put a program in place to plug the gaps? And I would say I would. So when you're thinking about your own company and you think about these kinds of things, and by the way, some of these things aren't the responsibility of the security team. Asset management doesn't tend to sit with security. It'll sit with just IT operations, right? Maybe you've got a really dodgy help desk who can be socially engineered all the time. I'm sure you'll hear talks about that during the day, right? Maybe you need to have something in your security strategy that shores up other parts of the organization in the name of security that doesn't really help your overall team, but it does help the overall security profile of the organization. So give that some thought. Um, good practice is another element. I would be remiss if I didn't say, you've got to think about what the threats are. Um, and I, I put these into two, three buckets. Oh, coffee, haven't had much today. Um, one is what's happening within your organization. In higher ed, we have a lot of click happy people. So email security, um, giving up uh, credentials, those kinds of problems. Yeah, it's a big threat in higher ed. We receive, by the way, also, just from an external perspective, from a nation state industry perspective, we receive more phishing than all other verticals combined. Combined. So you think you've got a phishing problem? Come to higher ed and see, see what's what, right? Um, so what are our internal uh, problems? Ransomware is big in higher ed. Um, insider threat is big in higher ed, right? What are our um, general industry trends? We just talked about those. And then every one of us has to think about the potential for nation state. And I will say the word solar winds, but it's a good example of, you know, stuff's happening because somebody's targeting 
Israel or Iran or the United States or Russia or China or whatever, and we're getting the blowback from it. Um, and I'm sure there will be lots of talks today about that, lots of talks at RSA, lots of talks at Black Hat. Um, but the reality is we, we're all going to get sucked by it. So um, think about what those threats are. And if you're really worried about them, you need to have something in your strategy that addresses them. And then last but not least, um, innovation. I was going to put this slide up with a whole bunch of words that you're all going to know. Um, but I just decided to put buzzword bingo on it, right? This could be 5G, it could be artificial intelligence, it could be drones, it could be disinformation, it could be deep fakes, it could be whatever. There's gonna be something that is coming future focused at you. So everything I've talked about up until now has been, what do you see in the environment today that needs attention? But part of your strategy, particularly if you're the security leader, is to be forward looking. So what's coming? And uh, certainly, you know, we, we all went from on-prem to cloud. And it was like, shit, cloud's coming. Are we ready for cloud? Are we ready for cloud? And, and for most of us, we're still not ready for cloud, not really. Um, so it could be a tech innovation like that, but it could also be a business innovation. So again, you know, from a higher ed perspective, COVID just accelerated the fact that most of our people want to do school and research from home. So what does it mean to do that securely? And what, do, what does the security team and the security strategy need to include so that we can innovate in that space? And I would also say, by the way, if you're running a team of people who are security folks, you want to be playing in the innovate space or they'll get bored and they'll leave. So innovation is an important thing to put into a security strategy. All right, so you've got all these things, right? Here's a summary of, of, of sort of what we're, what I'm thinking about. I've got all these, I've got all these regulations that I have to worry about. I've got these business needs. I've got an org structure kind of thing, including, by the way, declining budgets. There's always declining budgets in higher ed, even if there's not. I managed to grow our security budget every year, but overall budgets went down over the last eight years. Um, great practices, good practices, good enough practices threats that we have to think about. And are there innovation opportunities in higher ed? Absolutely there are. They come from not only startup vendors that we work with, but also internally, actually from an insider threat perspective, the computer science department, faculty and students are nasty, man. So you, 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 <laughs> there are a lot of really smart people in higher ed that you can innovate with, uh, which is awesome, which is one of the reasons I love being in higher ed. But everything's got two sides, right? Yay for innovation. We did a lot with autonomous vehicles and autonomous vehicle security. And oh, by the way, uh, when it came to insider threat, I was dealing with the same damn people. So fun times in higher ed. All right. So you've got these six elements put together. Then the question is, what do you do with it? Well, the first thing I'm going to tell you to do is go out and, and do some independent sense checking of your thinking, okay? Um, there is a lot going on in everyone's world and you can't know everything. So networking, coming to events like this, but also looking at some of the data reports that are out there uh, is super important. Um, I'm gonna talk about one and I'm gonna talk about it because I'm living the dream of it at the moment. Cisco did a report, it was a study in 2020 called the Security Outcomes Study. Um, it was double blind. Cisco didn't actually conduct the study, nor did they know who was in it. But they, uh, the study was included um, more than a thousand companies, security practitioners and IT practitioners. And they were asked questions like, what do you care about for your security program? What activities do you do that lend itself to those things? And what correlates to good outcomes positively and how much, okay? So, okay, so I'm thinking about my strategy and I'm thinking I've got to have something because we're going to the cloud and I've got to have something that's going to help us comply with CMMC and I've got all of these things. But what's really important for a security program? Well, on the, on the vertical on this chart, you will see some business outcomes, some security outcomes that this, this group of people who were surveyed thought were positive things that they wanted. Okay, so, you know, keeping up with the business, absolutely getting peer buy-in was really important if you're going to have a good program, being cost efficient, retaining security talent. These are some outcomes we want out of our security program. 
And then along the bottom, we've got activities, there are about 25 of them, that people were asked about, what did they do? Why did they do them? What kind of benefit did they see in relation to those outcomes that they were going for? What you find is, if you go to the left-hand side of this graph, the darker blue is a higher positive outcome. And across all of the outcomes that we were looking for, there were some four or five that sort of correlated pretty positively to all of them. So if I'm thinking about a security strategy, I wanna make sure that those outcomes are included somewhere in my security strategy, okay? Interestingly, um, some of the data, there were things here that um, did had, had less of a positive outcome. So, you know, go look at the things to the right-hand side of this scale and go, well, hang on, I would, I would think that um, having a secure development approach would be good. Well, it is, it's not that it independently isn't good, but it wasn't a very high positive correlated to these business outcomes. There will be future studies, by the way, from Cisco. So um, watch this space. And there are many studies out there, right? You can certainly look at the Verizon breach reports, see what kinds of things are happening in your industry and a whole bunch of other kinds of reports. Uh, this is just one. So I summarized that slide for you, right? So the three things on the left-hand side here are the outcomes that I don't know any security leader would disagree with these as being outcomes we want, right? We need to enable the business, we need to manage risk and we need to operate efficiently. Again, every dollar I spend is a dollar not going towards your scholarship. So I better be doing something good with it, right? On the right hand side, these are the five practices that most positively correlated with those outcomes. Um, and you'll see some of these are security things and some of these are not security owned things. Having a proactive tech refresh program is sometimes something that security has influence over and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and certainly in higher ed where we have lots of people making IT decisions independently of the center, um, proactive tech refresh is a bit of a, is a, bit of a struggle actually. So um, that's a thing. Well integrated tech, what we mean here is well integrated security technology um, and a security tech stack. Hard to do if you don't have well, well integrated IT in general. Um, but basically what, we, what we're trying to say here is if you have security stuff that talks well with each other so you don't end up with blind spots, you're probably gonna have an efficient program, you're probably gonna be enabling the business and managing risk, right? Um, An accurate threat detection is number five, right? So feel free to go read this report if you want to go see it in detail. It is free um, and uh, love to get your comments on it. If you read it, let me know what you think. But from a strategy perspective, I'm going, okay, I've got what I think I need to have. Now I'm seeing this data that says I've got these elements that I really should probably be including somewhere. So, you know, how do I put it all together? So one is, I, I'm going to tell you right away, you want to know your business. We started with this. Know where your business wants you to go. Are you, do you want to be award winning? Do you want to be duct taped? Do you want to be somewhere in the middle? Apply those strategy elements around it. Validate externally. So here's the example for me. This is, this is an example in higher ed. By the way, I'm no longer there. Some of these things are still in place. Some of these things have already been done. Um, from a governance perspective, we did implement a security framework. Uh, so we had a framework that says this is the base level of security everyone needs, but with network segmentation and other things, we applied the higher levels. So not the entire university doesn't have to be HIPAA compliant, just the pieces that have to be HIPAA compliant. The entire university doesn't have to change their passwords every 90 days, thank you PCI. Only this, the segments that deal with PCI have to change their passwords every 90 days those kinds of things, right? So, so we had a baseline framework plus segmented other things because we needed to do that. Now, does that mean my security stack is less integrated? Yes. Does it mean it's more expensive? Yes. Am I willing to make that trade-off? Yes, because if I'd have gone in and said the whole university needs to be CMMC compliant, they would have like hung drawn and quartered me before I even got started. So baby steps, okay? 
Secondly, I want to make sure I've got metrics and reporting in the governance space. So I want to know where we're starting and I want to know how well we go as we head there. So metrics and reporting is always a piece of that governance uh, strategy. Secondly, business strategy, definitely focusing on cloud for us, right? So again, it's going to support the distance education business objective. It's going to support remote learning. Um, fun fact, higher education in K through 12 does more Zoom sessions and more online sessions than all other verticals combined. Who knew, right? So yeah, we're remote, we get it. Um, and in my case, I had an ERP migration, but to be honest, I don't know how many people aren't doing some level of ERP migrations right now, or at least having some major administrative system that you're doing some migration to, probably from on-prem to the cloud. So part of my strategy was hook security to those projects and get funding for whatever I needed as it related to that project. So as a result of the ERP migration, I got five additional headcount that was paid for by the project that ultimately became part of my operational team. Um, and there were some technologies that needed to be in place in order for that project to work that we used for that project, but also for other things across the university as well. So aligning strategy to the business was a good thing because the business cared not for security so much, but they cared for the ERP migration. And I was able to piggyback and hitch myself to that need. Managing threats, ransomware insider threat or continue to be big in higher ed. This is no big secret. So how do I think about that? I had a plan around email security. I had a plan around EDR, EDX, um, and I had a plan around UEBA, okay? so. Thinking about those are the threats I've got at the moment, um, and in an organisation that's that's got you know 70,000 students and 45,000 employees, you can't really get to those things overnight so easily. So, part of the strategy, um, managing the basics in again higher ed tech refresh vulnerability management, improving our ability to detect and respond really important. So that was part of the strategy. And I didn't include this, but it, it's sort of something that wraps around all of these. You need to make sure that you're incorporating a security first culture and enabling a security first culture as much as possible. So part of my security strategy was also rolling out a training and awareness platform that wasn't just one hour of PowerPoint training on what the law requires, but really focused on what people's jobs were. So if you're a sysadmin, what do you need to do know to do that securely? Or if you're a software developer, what do you need to do to do that securely? But also just general security awareness for everybody, which focused on them as personal non-employees. So how do they stay secure at home? What do they need to protect their kids online? What do they need to do for online banking? That kind of stuff, knowing that they would bring those habits back with them into the into the office. So we talked about that as well. And change doesn't happen overnight. So you'll see here on the bottom, I've got an arrow that talks about time. Different companies are gonna have a different time horizon. When I was in Wall Street banking, everything had to be done in six months or less. Now, whether it actually happened in six months or less is a different story, but the intent was everything happened in six months or less. Higher ed, three to seven years, right? So timing is, uh, is an interesting piece of this strategy as well. So what would the CISO do? This is how I approached it. Um, I'm sure you get 10 CISOs in a room. They're going to say, but Helen, you didn't think about X or Y or Z or yeah, I get it. But this is what I did. So the question for all of you is, what would you do? What would you do? So hopefully in, in walking you through my thought process, you'll get a sense of um, a way of thinking about creating a security strategy for your organization. Um, some of the things that you might want to take into account, maybe, hopefully, I've given you something where you went, oh, shit, I didn't think about that. And maybe you can take that away with you. Um, if you're not a security leader and you report to someone who is, um, maybe you'll go, oh, now I know why they're doing that. Or maybe you're like, I should have a talk to my boss because I think we should be doing these things too. So hopefully it's been useful to you. Um, I am available for questions. So what does everyone think? I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. All right, I am scanning for questions. I have one. How big was your team? In the beginning, I had about 20 people that included a lot of higher ed, uh, try again, a lot of identity and access management. So about a third of my team's identity and access management. 
When I left after eight years, we had about 65 people. Okay, that's that's about what I what I would have guessed, which is, uh, I don't know, some people would say maybe at least half as many as you could have really used. <laughs> yeah, I, I would tell you, when I left, I think there was still more growth to be done. I think uh, based on the current profile of the organization, they could probably grow by another 50% both in terms of headcount and in terms of budget. Um, but it's a journey, right? And you're never finished with it. And uh, we'll, we'll see what they do post COVID. It'll be interesting. Yeah. All right, we, we do have some questions coming in. Um, let's see, have you figured out a cheat code for dealing with competing stakeholders such as belligerent department heads? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a carrot and stick. Uh, so um, I, my, my preference wasn't to go to the stick first. My preference was to try and convince people that doing security was something that was in their interest, not my interest. Um, so uh, belligerent heads uh, often were belligerent because they didn't understand what the risks were that they were facing. So a lot of it was hey, look, I know that you've just spent 15 years of your life on this research thing, but if you don't have good backups and if you don't have good access controls and you go to publish your paper on this research that you've spent your entire life on and you realise the data's bad because someone hacked into your system 10 years ago and you didn't even know it, that could be a problem, right? And they're like, oh, yeah, that could be a problem. We're like, okay, so now let's talk about security. So a lot of it was that, but that doesn't scale very well. So... Um, some of the things we rolled out, we did push pretty hard at people and then, um, but everything we rolled out, we had a big communication program around it before we pushed it out. So, and, and we weren't, most of the time we weren't talking about the security reasons, we were talking about the business reasons why we needed to do it. That's how we handled it. Okay. Um, and then somebody else said, any cat herding tips, which I, I think you partially covered with that, with that answer. Yeah, I think um, um, one of the things we how did, did you do manage the audits. It's crazy to think what your audit schedule must have must have looked like. Uh, how did you manage the audits for all the compliance management uh, regulations you had to deal with? Yeah, interesting. So uh, I'll answer actually both of those questions to those two questions together. The way the university worked was that every college had its own IT shop and its own P&L. And then there was central security and central IT. So one of the cat herding things we had to do because we didn't have direct authority over their, their tech decisions or their control decisions uh, was we created a, a security sort of advocate program. Um, we call them security coordinators, but their role, they, they were hired by those departments. They sat in those departments um, and we trained them on how to do security things but they became our voice into things. But they were also the people that were on the response end of any audits that came through. So we had very few audits that actually applied to the entire university or overall. Identity and access management kinds of things did. Um, but more often an auditor would come in and audit just the hospital or they'd audit just the financial sector or they'd audit just the PCI segments. And we had those coordinators in those units who would do that. For us. So that wasn't part of my direct job to do. I would certainly support that and help consult and talk about what our security program was and those kinds of questions. But I wasn't on the, I wasn't the pointy end of the spear on those audits. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any suggestions for resources for developing the framework for compliance and regulations? Yeah, there's actually a lot out there and it depends which one you're going to go with. We decided on the NIST 853 because most of our funding comes through federal or state or local governments and they're all on the NIST platform, right? So it made sense for us to use NIST. If I, had, if I was part of an international company, I might use an ISO standard. Or if I wasn't particularly regulated, but I was maybe cloud first, I might do just do something from the Cloud Security Alliance. Um, all of those organisations have good resources on how to roll those things out. Um, I would actually go to your ISACs and, and if you've got an ISAC that you're a part of in your vertical and 
chances are someone's already done it in your vertical and talk to them and get help from them if you need some if you don't want to pay someone to come in and consult for you to to get it rolled out um, networking can't underestimate the power of networking there's going to be someone here at today's conference who will know how to do it including me by the way so hit me up if you want to take an offline conversation yeah helen's into the in the discord i've seen you there <laughs> um yeah. did you go in with an idea of what the staffing and structure should look like when you when you started out or did you use the first few weeks to kind of figure that out i was figuring that out every day of every eight of the eight years that i was there um i when i first started i i wasn't thinking of it so much in terms of staffing as i was in terms of functions that i needed so um, you know, I, I sort of came in and there were things that I expected to be there that weren't. There were some things that we had that I was delighted to find out that we had and I wasn't expecting them to be there either. Um, and then there were also areas, because this is what happens in industries, like state and local government do this too. They get by on duct tape and chewing gum, right? So it usually meant that there was one person who did a thing. I'm going to make an, I'm going to make something up. There was one person who did vulnerability management, or there was one person who did something really critical. So, from a staffing perspective, one of the first things I did was look to see where I had single points of failure and try and fix those. Um, and that was the original sort of piece of growth. Once that was taken care of, then I started adding functions that they didn't already have. Um, and over the years, in some cases, we had put in place a security thing that we really no longer needed. And so we retired those and then redeployed the staff for other purposes. So um, it, it, it's not something you can set and forget. So you've got to, as a leader, you've got to be looking at it all the time. Having, having I grew up in financial services and, and the idea of retiring a function <laughs> and, and, and you know, reusing those folks somewhere else is completely alien to me. <laughs> they yeah, just go on forever the mainframe never goes away well we got some um, of that too right go to any hospital and there's still windows 95 machines hooked up to medical t devices right so some things some things i wanted to get rid of but i couldn't because the business insisted on holding on to some piece of technology that required some old piece of security right this goes back yeah. to that integrated security tech stack um but what I was able to do in those cases to say, okay, if you really want to hold on to this, then you need to pay for the security that goes around it. So it becomes a negotiating point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Here's what it's going to cost you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to to live in the Stone Age. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Trying to figure out which one to go next. Um, go with next here. Were you able to leverage? Oh, okay, so how did you handle BYOD? I'm not sure that's going to be in. I'm not sure if that's answerable in the time that we have. Uh, go for I, it. I would tell you that I don't think I've. I think there's more work to be done. Um, higher ed has been BYOD from the beginning. Like I'll I'll give you an example. There is an expectation that a grad student is going to bring their own laptop into a lab and use their own laptop to do research because the granting agencies, the NSF, the, D the National Institutes of Health, whatever, they actually, those grants often don't have a lot of money associated with them. And so where they, where the researchers find, find savings, is by asking their grad students to bring their personal devices into the office, right? So it's part of the business model to assume that there is BYOD. Um, going down, the, the zero trust model actually goes a long way to supporting the BYOD model. And we didn't have that when I first started. Uh, so part of my strategy after I first started like two or three years in was to really try and accelerate zero trust to be able to say okay fine you're going to have your own device but it can't be jailbroken it has to be patched it has to be this and it has to be that um and in certain cases we are still going to air gap and we're not going to let you plug in your personal devices so again we we sort of segmented the network around where you would allow byod and where you didn't uh based on risk and that's that's what we've had to do but i i would tell you we haven't solved i haven't seen anyone solve for BYOD yet, let alone higher ed. I don't right. know. Someone tell me they, they've solved for it, I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm with you. You know, I think that 
best thing I can think of is is that zero trust approach. You know where you, you know you you vastly reduce the amount of damage a, a personal laptop could do and have some yeah. control over whether it's patched or not. Those kinds yeah. of things. Right. Uh, let's see. Were you able to leverage any public sector support, uh, for example, FBI, DOD, for security concerns and emerging threats? If so, mm -hmm. was it successful and any lessons learned? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, so certainly the, the, the feds and the FBI and others want to have good partnerships with higher ed because we are very much in the crosshairs of nation state uh, folks who want to steal intellectual property, right? Um, so, so the granting agencies, as well as the, I'll call them the policing agencies, were very good partners. I think we struggled, though, as all industries do, in in that one piece of the federal government will have information. They don't like to share it very quickly. By the time they get around to sharing it, it's been so sanitized that you've lost the context of what it is they want to share. Um, and it's also like nine months after the fact that they actually come to you and say, hey, have you seen these indicators of compromise on your network? And I'd be like, uh, well, if you'd come to me six months ago, I might have been able to answer that question, but yeah, no. Um, so, yeah, the I log retention that, is already done by that point, <laughs> like it's already rolled off the sim. That's right. That's right. So, you know, the, the, I, I applaud the federal government for trying to improve the private public relationships. I think they've they've got more work to do, but they're headed in the right direction. Again, I'd, I'd sort of the the communication point for me was really more around the ISACs. Um, and, and getting in with those groups, that, that was the most helpful. The other thing we did in, in higher ed, as much as Ohio State really hates Michigan on the football field, uh, the, the CSOs in the Big Ten, we meet every month and we have a lot of uh, collaborative security efforts that go on, including IOC sharing, you know, with the sticks taxi sort of background, that kind of thing. So we, we were doing what we could do to, to be as fast in detection and response as we could um, by joining hands and, and doing collaborative efforts with partners. I like think that's, that. that's really cool. That's almost a step up from the ISAC, you know, having, you know, that, that group of, so you actually get on like a Zoom call, something like that, where you're, you're kind of face to face talking to each other once a month? Yeah, absolutely. So, and once a quarter, we'd get in person too when, you know, oh, nice. pre COVID. So uh, I have a whole bunch of swag from all the Big Ten schools. We, we've exchanged challenge coins. Uh, but yeah, and, we, and like I said, we're doing a lot of collaboration. So we, we've collaborated on security assessments so that we don't all have to do our own security assessments of all the same vendors. Because we use a, a lot of the, you know, our, our ecosystem overlaps a lot. Um, and by the way, from an email perspective, if somebody is attacking, say, Illinois or Michigan or Rutgers or whatever, chances are they're going to turn around and spam the shit out of Ohio State using email accounts from those schools and they're trusted. So um, so it, they're, a, they're their own version of insider threat for us. So we all have to manage that as well. Yeah. Um, let's see, was the, let's see. I think you, you kind of addressed this earlier on, but with a, a culture focused on freely exchanging information, were there opportunities to to leverage some of the research teams in the in the university to find ways to help them better protect their own stuff? I guess. Yeah, it's been um, it it has been a journey. Um, it's like staff it? augmentation, maybe, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I started a, I started a student uh, internship program, so. Uh, I guess at its high point, I had about 15 students who were working with my team who would then go back into their particular departments and sort of spread the spread the love that way. There were some researchers, as much as I just beat up on the computer science department, I did have some partners in there who did some research on us with us on different kinds of technologies, um, particularly in the vulnerability management space and also in the mobile security space. Um, so, uh, so there has been some research sharing that's been going on. It's interesting though, because researchers are interested in the data 
and security practitioners are interested in the outcome and sometimes mm -hmm. those things don't align. So the, you have to have a fair amount of tolerance for each other's motivations when you do that kind of partnership, but sometimes it worked, sometimes. There's okay. definitely opportunity for that. If, you, if, you, if your company is anywhere near a college, a research university, or even a two year, there are resources there for you to pull on. So, so think about those in your staffing models. Um, they're hungry, they're curious, um, and they want something that's going to work on their resume. So uh, I can't, I can't emphasize enough how how good it is to be able to get a college student or even someone straight out of high school and have them come in and do an internship and just put them on a project that's been bothering you for a while, but you haven't really had the resources to get around it, just sick them on it. And you will get, I had students that, that created some fabulous Splunk dashboards for me that, that pulled on my identity information that we ultimately used in our Insider Threat program, that kind of thing. So use them, they're, they're, they're there for the taking. Good advice. Um, two more questions and, and I'll let you go. And yeah. I, I think that'll be it. Uh, was the university pressing to go to cloud? And if so, how did you deal with that from a security standpoint? Or how would you deal with that based on your experiences? <laughs> Universities want to go everywhere. I, so one of my colleagues, one of the guys on my team had actually worked for the university for 35 years. And when he started, he started as a student in the computer science department and he'd been working in the computer science department. He remembers them having conversations about whether or not they wanted to use the World Wide Web right and if you remember the web was really started for for research institutions right so we think these days from a tech perspective we tend to think of universities as this lagging thing there's a lot of stuff happening on campus it's right at the front bleeding edge of of tech so yeah people were going to the cloud way before the administrative center of the cloud yeah internet too look at internet too right um, for those of you who don't know. So most universities, their, their network background is, is supported by internet too. Um, and, and, you know, we've got hundred gigabit backbones that we're sitting on thanks to the need for sort of big fat network pipes that researchers need to be able to do all their compute. So um, yeah, there's, there is all kinds of tech at university and it typically happens before the administrative system. So, you know, we had an on-prem ERP system for 20 years and we moved it to the cloud and people were like, oh, you're moving it to the cloud. But it wasn't because it was going to the cloud. It was because we were changing the way they had to work. But the, the, the students were using cloud before then. The researchers were using cloud before then. So um, the hardest part about doing security in a university is keeping up with the tech. I have vendors that come out and say things like, they'll ask me, they'll say, what kind of network do you have? And I'll go, yep, because I got all of them, <laughs> right? And they're like, why? like what happened to one single tech stack and i'm like well because everyone one everyone makes their own it decisions and two everyone's got their own unique needs and there is no one tech vendor that's going to satisfy all of them so i've got all of them and that's how that works yeah and, and our final question um as a CISO, what kind of advice would you give um some employees who have seen five CISOs in six years uh, huh. Well, given that the average tenure of a CISO is what, 18 months, 18 24 months. months now? I think it's going up though. I think it's trending up. Yeah. Um, I would be less concerned about that as long as you like your job and you like the team that you're a part of. If when you say I've had X number of CISOs in Y number of years, what you really mean is, and every time they leave, they change the incoming CISO changes things, and I really hate that churn. And I um, I don't know where my own career is going because I don't have any mentors at the top. Then that's a then the problem there is what's your comfort level? And if you're not comfortable with it, find somewhere else. Um, but the I think you're going to find a high level. The CISO role is a churn and burn role, and I think you're going to. Me being there for eight years was more to do with, like seriously, is more to do with my masochism than it is because that's typical. So I would say, um, you know, always go back to what you value and what you need. And if you're not getting it, then it's a, a signal to leave, actually. Yeah, I know I, I've personally seen a lot of, uh, you know, just rooms full of broken toys and abandoned projects from 
you know, like each CISO has their, their thing that works for them, right? You know, their yes. combination of things, you know, but the, uh, the contracts that are signed are typically longer than <laughs> how long that CISO is going to be around. CISO lasts. So. Yeah. Now I will yeah. tell you, I've left, right? I've gone for two months. By the way, they will be hiring. Uh, they'll be posting that new CISO replacement job here at Ohio State in the next couple of months. So if, if you want to post for the job, <laughs> let me know. Happy to have a chat with you about it. Um, but I'm sure my my successor, whoever that is, is going to make changes. So uh, yeah, it happens. And, and I think that's healthy, actually. Um, yeah. Security and tech changes really fast. And so having different eyes on it, can make it stronger actually strength in diversity of thought yeah. all right uh amazing talk it was every bit i was hoping for uh and <laughs> and, and then some so uh thank you for sticking around answering the questions we had some yeah. great questions uh from the audience as well you know i think Thanks, at our everyone. There, we, had, we, we had about uh, 83 people uh watching and i'm sure uh, this will probably get a lot of views on YouTube once we get it up there as well. So that, that'll be nice. That'll be great. Thanks everybody. Um, and I'll, I'm hoping, I'm hoping, not confirmed yet, I'll be at uh, B-Sides Columbus. So feel free to check us out there too. Very cool. All right. All right. Thank you, Helen. Have a great day. You too.